Hello, I'm Barry Smith, editor of Electric Boogie, and I'd like to invite you all to journey with me on the path of the Electric Warrior. On September the 16th, 1999, I co-organised a coach tour around London to take fans to see the many sites that were concerned with Mark's life and career. This unique video takes in many highlights from that tour and also includes some places that we didn't actually get to see. Also included are many places that are very little known to the Boland scene. We were very fortunate to actually gain access to Mark's homes at Barnes and at Stoke Newington and I'm sure that you will find the inside shots from these properties to be of very, very great interest. Caroline Feld, Mark's cousin, also helped us and she is also included in an interview which you will find to be amusing and interesting. So let's start where it all began and let's journey on on the path of the Electric Warrior. Old Hackney Hospital, Homerton Road. The birth of a legend. September the 30th, 1947, saw the arrival here of Britain's future superstar-to-be, Mark Feld, later to find fame as Mark Bolan. Born to Phyllis and Simeon Feld, and brother to Harry, it's interesting to note that the man who was later to sing about hot love, summer deep, and urges to celebrate summer, was born just before one of the coldest winters this century. Perhaps he remembered. We're standing currently at the moment in the vestibule of 23 or 25, certain units in uh, common, whichever you look at. If you look at Mark's birth certificate, it's actually 23, now known as 25, but this is the very door that Mark would actually have gone through, or the doorway rather than the door, into his home from 1947 through to 1962, where he lived with his mum and, of course, Harry. A short way up the road where we've just been or we've just seen is Northwell Primary School, where he used to go to as a youngster and the bus stop a little bit further up along the road, number 73, to take him there. The flat is actually split into two. There is another one just here, um, but this, this particular one is on two levels, which includes a bathroom, two bedrooms, one of which was a lounge originally when Mark was here, which was converted into a front bedroom for the two lads. It was from this house that Mark was moved, much to his um, disappointment when they upped sticks and went to Summers Town. Mark was very much the face around this area. He was known as the local. Um, not a wide boy, but he was, he was the face and he wasn't very appreciative when he actually moved to Summers Town where he was basically nothing and had to work his way up again. So, a historic little place this, Mark's first home from 1947 when he was born, kept kicking and screaming into the world and was brought to this very, very building. We also see here a small park area which would have been used by Mark and Harry to play in as small boys and it's quite interesting to sort of picture back and see these two lads playing outside their mum's, mum and dad's house. Across the road there is a shop now which used to be an off licence where apparently Mark used to take bottles back to supplement his pocket money. That was in the old days when you used to get bottles and not tin cans and you could take them back 
and I believe the soda story girls might use to collect the bottles from the back of the building and then take them back round through the front and get the money all over again. A little bit further down the road here is the number 73 bus stop and that is where Mark used to catch his bus to go to the William Wordworth School and the Hillcroft Secondary Schools. He also used to catch the bus here to go to Berwick Street to see where his mum worked and there's also of course where his favourite record store, Music Land, was. Less than five minutes walk away from Stoke Newington Common is Ospedestrian Road and it was here that Mark's paternal grandparents had their home. Mark would very often come here after school to await his parents' collection as they were working later in the evening. Of course, being his grandparents, it was a frequent place to visit and they would often come on weekends for dinner and for tea. Northwold Road, Library and School. This was the area of London that the young Mark hung around in the early 1960s. And Northwold Road Primary School was the first school that he attended from 1952 until 1958, when he left to go to the William Wordsworth Junior School, and the senior branch, Hillcross Secondary School, was the school that he was supposedly expelled from, according to Mark, that is. What we're looking at here is the actual gateway that Mark would have gone through as a young lad, and you can see very clearly the words boys, and further down is where the girls used to go through, they were kept segregated, as was the norm in the old days. We're now in an area of London called Stamford Hill, which of course was the real stamping ground for Mark in his formative years. Across the road you can see a building with a blue canopy and a bit of a garish frontage called Cash City. This was in fact called Fair Sports in Mark's day and was an amusement arcade that was well supported by him and his boyhood friends and it was known locally as the Shtip, a Jewish phrase which means to take your money. Caroline Feld, Mark's cousin, wasn't allowed to go here really. It wasn't considered nice for girls to go to that kind of place. But Mark would take her along anyway and hide her behind the one-armed bandits and if anyone came in and might have known her parents they couldn't see that she was there. Just a little further down the road you can see a place called Freed's Fish Market but again in Mark's day it was known as something else and it was in fact the E&A Milk Bar. This coffee cum milk bar was a favourite rendezvous point for Mark and his friends particularly his mob mates when he was known as the face around the area. It was also a delicatessen and Caroline tells a story of how she and Mark used to go in there and buy the salt beef that they both so loved. Looking a little further down the road is a restaurant called The Red Sea. And it's still a restaurant, because in Mark's day it was a restaurant called La Fontaine. And it was outside here that he used to busk in the early 60s and used to make quite a living at it too, according to Caroline, who also remembers a young and unknown Cat Stevens joining Mark on some occasions. Still in the same area, we're now looking at Star Express. Still a burger bar, it was in fact the Wimpy Bar where Mark used to wash up in his early days. This was another venture to boost his pocket money, and we all know what he spent his pocket money on. Clothes and records. A little further down the road is Amos Road situated in this vicinity was the Jewish synagogue. On a Saturday they used to hold the Saturday Club and Caroline and Mark used to attend here. I won't go into the story anymore, I'll let Caroline tell you all about it. This used to be one of our discos where Mark and I used to go on a Saturday evening. I'll never forget that 
Mark came down here one Saturday night and some of my friends asked me would I like to come down and I said no, I was too tired because I used to work doing hairdressing on a Saturday. But, and when they came back on the Sunday and they spoke to me, they said, Caroline, you've got to come down to this club. There's a boy down there, he's absolutely fabulous. All the girls are going mad over him. You, you've got to meet him. So I said, okay. So the following Saturday I came down with my friends, I was ever so tired and I was lining up to put my coat away, come in these doors and I remember lining up and all of a sudden somebody put their hands across my eyes and all of a sudden I heard the girls going oh, oh, and I thought what's wrong and I turned around and of course it was Mark's hands over my eyes and we kissed and cuddled and everything else and the girls kept saying to me, Caroline, that's the boy we were telling you about. Do you know him? And I said, of course, it's my cousin. Well, from that day to this day, I've made so many friends over this. And Mark introduced me to so many of his friends. And Mark and I got closer and closer. And this place brings good, good memories for Mark and I. It's really terrific, terrific days. I mean, you can't beat them. Mark used to come and call for me and we used to play here. I used to sit on the step there and Mark used to do his singing and dancing. We used to have shows here with all the girls and boys and then we used to go upstairs to my parents' flat. And round the corner here, if you follow me, under the arches, used to be a playground called the Big Boys Playground where the boys used to play football and the girls used to watch and Mark used to play there with us as well. Just round the corner here. This remembers years and years ago. Upset me to come back here and watch all this now. Well, as you can see, the boys are still playing and the girls are still watching. And that's where Mark and I used to play with all of our friends. Eighty one Lexham Gardens. Eighty one Lexham Gardens was the home of Alan Warren, Mark's first manager, whom he met when Warren was a presenter on Children's TV Five O'Clock Club. Mark used to visit the studio where the programme was recorded, and as a result became friendly with him. A strong friendship was soon formed, and Mark moved into Warren's flat, taking over the spare bedroom. According to Warren, Mark used to spend all day in the drawing room with the curtains closed and the lights on. Apparently he used to prefer the night time and so by shutting it out the night never ended and the day never started. He was interested in clubs however, and he used to frequent them as often as possible. Warren was the person responsible for arranging Mark's first Columbia audition with Blowing in the Wind, as well as the Vic Keery Maximum Sound Studio session where Mark recorded Blowing in the Wind again and the road among Gloria as Toby Tyler. He lived here for eight months or so from 1964 until 1965 when Mike Preskin came onto the scene and he moved into his flat instead.
Vic Keery, Maximum Sound Studios, 47 Dean Street, Soho. What you're looking at, the shutters on the right, was where Mark in 1965 January recorded two songs in what had formerly been the premises for a pirate radio station. One of the songs, Dylan's Blowing in the Wind, he had previously recorded as a demo for his then manager Alan Warren, which had been used in an attempt to secure a Columbia recording deal. He failed the audition. However, Mark must have really liked the song, because along with a little-known Dion DiMucci song called The Road Among Gloria, he tried it again. Laying down numerous takes of both songs, Mark, or Toby Tyler as he was then known, stamped his own style on both songs by altering the tempo or omitting verses. The resulting takes lay hidden for years until finally getting a single and CD album release in the 1990s. It has to be said that Mark was not an experienced harmonica player and the sounds that escape can be a little ear-bending at times. However, the two tracks do show that Mark was aware of the music of the time, and it is great to hear the young Mark in his pseudo Dylan Donovan phase. His vocals are a little flatter than those on The Wizard, released later that same year, but, on the final takes at least, his self-assurance shines through. It's ironic to consider the subject matter of The Road I'm on Gloria in the light of the tragic events of September the 16th, 1977. Equally ironic is the emergence of the Joe Meek acetate called Mrs. Jones. Gloria and Jones? It seems Mark was destined to meet Gloria Jones. Two Eyes Coffee Bar, Old Compton Street, Soho. Now called The Dome, this was in fact the site of the legendary coffee bar that became a must-visit place in the late 50s and early 60s. It was a place that Mark used to visit during the times he was supposed to be helping his mum out on the market stall. It was here, he said once in an interview, that he met Harry Webb, later Cliff Richard of course, who was trying to establish himself in the music world. Other stars who began their careers here included Tommy Steele and Adam Faith, and so it's very easy to understand why Mark loved the place. Apparently he used to be given enough money by Phyllis to get himself a coffee there, and he would eagerly wait for customers to use the jukebox so that he could listen to the latest hits, not having enough money himself, of course, to feed the jukebox. Decca Recording Studios, 165 Broadhurst Gardens, West Hampstead. Used by the likes of the Moody Blues, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, this studio was the scene for Mark's first solo commercial venture on the 14th of September 1965, two weeks before his 18th birthday. Released on the Decca label, The Wizard, backed with Beyond the Rising Sun, was Mark's first solo single and was the record that first brought him to the attention of the record buying public with appearances on Ready Steady Go and Thank You Lucky Stars. Arranged by Gary Glitter's musical partner-to-be Mike Leander, now no longer sadly with us, it was produced by American producer Jim Economides and was the first time that the name Bolan was used. It's interesting to note that Mark's first and last producers were both American, Economides and Visconti, and also that four of the biggest names of the 70s, Mark, Bowie, David Essex and Rod Stewart, all passed through the Decca roster before achieving superstardom. Two hundred Upper Richmond Road, currently a firm of um, architects and another club. But back in 1965, this club was called the Pontiac Club, and it was the very first um, place that Mark played live back in '65 around November. Now it's fair to assume that in 1965, with the single being released at the Wizard, Mark actually performed those songs here, the Wizard and Beyond the Rising Sun. But we can't be sure of that. No records exist. But given the time, it's fair to assume that that is the case. Following the gigs here, Mark then did a second gig at Wembley where he would have then performed those same songs in front of some students. So, very, very famous, um, a little bit of landmark history for the Mark Bowen Front, Mark's first live venue.
The Electric Garden, later Middle Earth, 43 King Street, Covent Garden. This impressive looking building was in fact the Electric Garden Club and it was the place where Mark's first version of Tyrannosaurus Rex, the five man band, played their debut gig in June or July of 1967, the exact date not being known. The whole gig was a total disaster as the five members had only got together a very short time before and had carried out little or no rehearsals. Mark's view was that there was no need to rehearse if you had the right musicians. He was obviously wrong as by all accounts the resulting musical output was awful and audience reaction was not good to say the least. Mark had formed the band following his resignation from John's Children, recruiting Steve Took and Ben Cartland and two others, whose names are unknown, into the fold. Had the band been a success then history would be totally different. As it was, Mark was bitterly disillusioned and vowed to never play electric guitar again. He was also helped along this road by track records retrieval of his electric gear anyway, as it was a legacy and it still belonged to John's Children. After this humiliating debacle, Mark's career with Steve Took headed off in a totally opposite direction. The club later changed its name to Middle Earth, after Tolkien's fantasy world, and Mark and Steve, as members of a very different sounding Tyrannosaurus Rex, played many gigs here and at the Roundhouse where the club moved to in July 68, when John Peel was DJ and MC. At first many of the gigs were unpaid, but once Deborah and My People Were Fair had been commercial successes, and after they had sessioned for the BBC, that soon changed. La Gioconda, Denmark Street. The building you're looking at now, Burino Restaurant, was in fact La Gioconda. Situated not far from Vic Curie's studios, this was a musician's coffee bar and it was sometimes the place that provided the musicians used by Vic Keery to record at his studio. However, the Bolan connection is that Mark sometimes used this place in the mid-sixties and visited it on occasions in the company of David Bowie, then like Mark, a singer searching for the big time. Other regular Mark co-coffee drinkers were Eric Hall and Steve Harley, who was later to front Cockney Rebel and who played on Mark's Dandy in the Underworld album, whilst Mark played on Harley's album Hobo with a Grin. It has a long history of musical interest and a few others are that the Small Faces made the decision to turn professional here and that David Bowie also met his future backing group the Lower Third at this building. To the left of the building you see a black door which leads down to the recording studio that the musicians used to jam and that is still there. One hundred eight Lexham Gardens. They say that life is full of coincidences, and this was one of them. Some three years after Mark had moved out of Lexham Gardens, the area was to play a big part in his career once again. Tony Visconti, then only newly arrived in Britain and starting out on his partnership with Straight Ahead Productions, took a flat at one hundred eight Lexham Gardens, just a short distance from where Mark had lived at Alan Warren's flat. In September nineteen sixty-seven. Following Tony's discovery of Tyrannosaurus Rex at the UFO Club, the band came to this flat to play for him and to show what they were all about. It demonstrates Mark's genius well when you consider that he and Steve played Visconti all of the tracks that eventually appeared on their first album, My People Were Fair, plus a few more. This session was recorded by Visconti on a two-track recorder and is still in his possession. Several years ago it was cited for a release, but it never materialised. Let's hope that Visconti gets around to it one day as it should be a marvellous piece to hear. However, a couple of the extra tracks have sneaked out on Mark on Wax releases, Lunas is Back and Puckish Pan, retitled as Rock Me, but the version of Hippie Gumbo still stays unheard. It was the day after this performance that Mark and Steve auditioned for Denny Cordell and Regal's Honor Phone. Right, here we are at 2 Park Square Mews, Upper Harley Street, London. This was once the flat of Mark's friend and photographer Pete Sanders and DJ extraordinaire John Peel and was a popular meeting place for music biz personalities. It was also the scene for the photos used on Tyrannosaurus Rex's third album Unicorn, 
when Mark took along some of his own belongings for the shoot. Knowing the effect he was after, he took Blake's complete works, a children's Shakespeare volume, and as well as the books by the mystic Kelly Orgio Brown. Pete complimented them with his own Singer sewing machine and a book on the Cottingley Fairies. Using the flat's kitchen for the shoot, the resulting photos showed Mark and Steve in a new light, as hippie love gods, and the cover shot was the first to feature full-face portraits of them. In a recent conversation with me, Pete told me that he was never entirely happy with the photos, but I have to say that I can't see why. I think they're great. Following Mark and June's lightning speed romance and get-together, they moved here to take up residence in the cold water, one-room attic flat at the princely sum of £2, 8 shillings and sixpence a week, which works out, I think, about £2.45. And they lived here from 1968 through until 1971. It was here that Mark wrote most of the Tyrannosaurus Rex material after the My People Were Fair album, in his own Toadstool Studios, a little alcove off the main room, curtained off and insulated with egg cartons for Mark's exclusive use. June used to tell the story of how Mark would work for hours and hours and how she would hear strange noises emanating from behind the curtain. If Mark asked her advice, and when she gave it he didn't agree, he would storm off in high dudgeon back into the den, muttering and mumbling to himself. Later he would emerge with an amended song or poem along the line of June's earlier comments, and he would be highly pleased with himself. June's contribution was not admitted of course. In 1970, this flat was the birthplace of his most successful composition to date, Rider White Swan, and as such can also be considered the birthplace of T-Rex. <laughs> Riding all out like a bird in the sky was riding all out like you were a bird Flying all out like an eagle in a sunbeam Riding all out like you were a bird Wear a tall hat like a druid in the old days Wear a tall hat and a touch of the gown Ride a white swan that the people of a bell team Where you head long, babe, you can't go wrong Catch a bright star and a place it on your forehead Say a few spells and baby, there you go Take a flat cat and sit you down your shoulder And in the morning you'll know all you know We're now looking at Chenison Lodge, 46 Chenison Gardens. Though no longer used for its former purpose, this was originally Kensington Register Office, where on January the 30th, 1970, Mark Bolan and June Child tied the knot. A spur of the moment idea, not even Mark's parents were aware of it. Mark and June took along a handful of invited guests, namely Mickey Finn and his girlfriend Sue Worth, Jeff Dexter, Alice Ormsby Gore, who was Eric Clapton's fiance, and Pete Saunders. Pete took some photos of the celebrations, whilst a passerby was handed Pete's camera and asked to take a group shot. Mark and June's witnesses on this auspicious event were Pete Saunders and Alice Ormsby Gore. The register office has now moved to new premises, but it's still here for us to enjoy and see now. Milton Towers Marble Arch. As a result of the intense media and fan attention that T-Rex attracted owing to 1971's mega success of four hit singles and three hit albums, Mark and June found it impossible to stay at Clarendon Gardens once fans had found out the address. 
They moved here early in 1972 and took up residence and refuge high up in number 47, where they could at least look out of the window without being seen. June once told a story of how Mark wrote the classic Spaceball Ricochet here, based on the fact that a little boy living in the flats had his favourite baseball boots, but he couldn't pronounce the name properly and he called them Spaceball Boots. On visiting the flat one day, he proceeded to bounce around the room much to Mark and June's amusement, and it sparked off the idea in Mark's mind. Abbey Road Studios Possibly the most famous studios in the world, owing to its Beatles connections, the famous zebra crossing as seen on the Abbey Road album sleeve is still here. These studios were also the scene of Mark's audition for Columbia Records when he sang a cover of Betty Everett's You're No Good in Studio 3 on February 16, 1965. Unfortunately, his performance wasn't good enough to win him a contract and the audition was a failure. However, Mark was later to return here when he recorded the overdubs for the movie Born to Boogie and also filmed the studio footage featuring Ringo and Elton John playing on Children of the Revolution and Tutti Frutti. It is probable that Mark's final studio work was carried out here as Mike Mansfield stated that Mark was working with Gloria laying down some brass tracks for a project that he was working on in early September 1977. Sixty nine New Bond Street. From nineteen seventy three until nineteen seventy seven, this building was the host to the T Rex offices, following its move from the temporary premises in Doughty Street. It saw many photo shoots, especially in nineteen seventy three to four when Mark was sporting short hair, and magazines and music papers were full of the new look Mark. Just inside the main window there used to be a large rocking horse which Mark had installed, and he was once photographed astride it whilst wearing a denim shirt, a diamante necklace, sequin trousers and platform shoes. This office was a magnet to fans and some fortunate ones managed to gain access and meet Mark. Other than that though, if he was out and about, Mark was more than happy to chat and talk and to be photographed outside this building by his people. Macari's Guitar Shop, Tottenham Court Road. This music shop is famous, well, bowling wise, for the fact that it was here that Mark purchased his Wawa pedal that is said was used on the classic hit, 20th Century Boy. The Roxy Club, Neal Street, Covent Garden. Now a boutique, Red or Dead, this was originally the Roxy Club, which by 1977 was already renowned for its support of the punk rock movement that had exploded onto the music scene in 1976, and to which Mark had been quick to voice his support for the new style of music, even though it was completely at odds to his own style. In 1977, he took leading punk rockers The Damned along as support act for his Dandy in the Underworld tour, which was acclaimed by fans and the critics alike as a fantastic success. On the 9th of March, the night before the start of the tour, EMI held a party at the Roxy to celebrate the release of the Dandy in the Underwood album. Considering that a few months earlier Mark had been considered past it, the press were eager to be in on the event, and one report went, League of the Week took place at the Roxy in Covent Garden to launch Mark Boland's new album Dandy in the Underworld. Many very wonderful music business personages in attendance. Donovan, Mike Mansfield, young Mark himself, Lionel Bart, he's getting everywhere these days, what's his game, a black-haired Johnny Rotten, Harry Nilsson, and punks aplenty. Also in attendance that night were Captain Sensible of the Damned, Sid Vicious, and Billy Idol, the person of whom Mark said on his Mark show, and I quote, he was supposed to be as pretty as me.
142 Upper Richmond Road West, the home of Mark and Gloria from January 1977. Very famous um, home. This was the one that people have seen in the videos with Mark eating a peach and playing and generally larking about in the garden. Also the home that was um, the one that they were returning to in September 1977 on the eve of that crash. Uh, we're hoping to get behind to see what's in the garden now. We'll knock on the door and see what the reaction is going to be. This house also was the host to Steve Harley and David Bowie, amongst many other famous guests that Mark invited in. It was also the house that sadly got broken into when Mark was killed and certain fans stole items from the house. How they'll ever live with their consciences, I'll never know. Looking through the arch and into the grounds, originally there was an old stable through here, but unfortunately in the 1987 storms the roof was damaged and so the building had to be demolished. Further round, which we can't see, was originally the garage, and when the new owners moved in they found Mark's white Rolls Royce still in there. In the property itself there was still Mark and Gloria's piano, which the owners wanted to purchase but unfortunately it had already been pre-sold via the Mark Feld estate. Here we are actually in the grounds of 142 Upper Richmond Road West. Very, very beautiful area as you can see and through the archway there, um, which we can't actually get access into at the moment because the, the current owners are having building work done, is the famous garden where we assume that the, the peach video was taken and where Mark and his guests would have partied and had dinner parties and whatever they felt like doing in their own, the safety of their own home. This area where we're standing now is at the side of the house and if we pan round you'll see um, the actual house itself. I don't think this is an original um, at the side here, but certainly the windows and things are. And um, it's not hard to imagine Mark being here in 1977, enjoying the trappings of his success. What a shame, though, that he wasn't able to enjoy it for a lot, lot longer. But a beautiful place, and um, certainly a very fitting home, I think, for, for Mark. The current owners of this house have actually been here since 1977 or 78 when they purchased the property from the Mark Bolin estate. So it's nice to know that this house has been much loved for the last 20 years. Um, the lady of the house, they don't wish to reveal their name, which is, which is fine, but they don't tell us that they, they are used to having pilgrimages of fans coming to the house and they have in the past been quite amenable to people coming around and having a look. But um, they were very good to let us in today and see and show you Many of you out there that have never seen this property, me included, um, the beauty of Mark's 1977 residence. Morton's Restaurant, Barclay Square. This was a restaurant that Mark and Gloria were returning home from on September the 16th, 1977. Mark had been to the restaurant before and it was well known to and well patronised by Jewish entertainers. During the day of the 16th, Mark had been busy visiting old friends and visiting the dentist, whilst the evening was spent in the speakeasy club with his old mate Jeff Dexter. Just after midnight, Mark, Gloria and her brother Richard arrived at Morton's and met up with Eric Monster Hall, Mark's old friend and roadie, as well as being the frog for New York City, but he left about an hour or so later. After whining and dining in the upstairs restaurant, Mark, Gloria and Richard went downstairs to the bar to listen to music, 
but Gloria was persuaded to play the piano and to sing to Mark in front of a dozen or so people. Around 4am the party left Morton's with Mark and Gloria taking their own car, whilst Richard and Victoria, a singer from the club, followed in his. They were returning to Mark's and Gloria's home in Upper Richmond Road West. Here we are at the um, Performing Rights Society Memorial, which was put in place on um, September the 15th, 1997. Uh, placed in um, memorial of Mark, where Roland came over from America for the first time to officially recognise the place where his father had this earth. And the actual tree from the base of here, you can look up, there. The memorial was placed here to make it safe for fans to come and pay their respects for Mark and not be on the road. As you can see with the cars rumbling across it isn't very safe at all. The memorial was put in place by the Performing Rights Society in recognition of what Mark achieved in his lifetime but also because what a lot of people don't know is that Mark still continue to support charities and children's homes through his royalties um, and that is it. that's something that he actually willed and will continue while his records are still selling and this is one of the reasons why the Performing Rights Society wants to recognise such a great gesture by a great man. We're gonna miss you, T-Rex, we're gonna miss you, T-Rex, we're gonna miss you, and we know you'll miss us too, we're gonna miss you, T-Rex, we're gonna miss you, T-Rex, we're gonna miss you. We know you'll miss us too You told us get on The children of the revolution Sing this get on The children of the revolution Sing this miss you T-Rex wake on miss you T-Rex you
Jokes what about the Jewish pedophile. How many sweets? <laughs> Not one of the most pleasant days this year, is it? But you can see God's crying because it is a day of remembrance, and uh, it just seems another year goes by. Harry, family and friends, 1999 is the last year of this century and uh, as we approach a new millennium, the legend of Mark Boland will be remembered by a whole new generation. After 22 years, the music, the t ecstasy, is not and will not ever be forgotten. Had he been with us today, Mark would have been celebrating in a couple of weeks his 52nd birthday, in a physical sense. In a spiritual sense, he still will be, and as he's looking down on us here, he's through us, he's with us, and he's next to us. And the message from Mark is that heaven is hot, babe. Yes, it is. This year, I want you to spare a special thought for Gloria, who I know, after a brief conversation with her, she so much wanted to share this special day and be with the fans. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen, because a small element has spoilt that for the rest of us. But Gloria comes here privately. This year, the message across the Atlantic to her is that we forgive you and we love you because 2000 is a new millennium. And we hope on next year, Saturday the 16th of September, Gloria will be standing alongside us. Special thought on this day too for Roland. Fortunately, Roland could not be with us. He's, gonna be, he's on his way to London. So, the, uh, so what I understand, and he'll be coming here within the next few days. Uh, through Roland, we, we hope to continue to carry on the, the charisma that his late father, God rest his soul, carried out. And when, you, when Roland's here standing alongside his family, the most loyal and ardent fans in the world feel Mark's presence. Harry and Sandy, it's a time of reflection. At this moment, we are celebrating the Jewish New Year, as you both know, and Yom Kippur. May dear Almighty God bless the souls of your dear parents, Simeon and Phyllis, and Mark. Caroline, aunts and uncles, you know, um, Happy New Year. May you have plenty of koyak and nachas for the following year, which of course means strength and rejoicing. But this special day belongs to the T-Rex family. Some have come from all four corners of the United Kingdom, from the Ukraine, from Germany, from Denmark. In fact, the legend is huge. The tribute bands that enable the legend to live on do such a good job, and long may they continue to flow in. The great work by the fan clubs, all of them is appreciated and the loyalty of the fans. Mark was a devoted musician. That was my father what I'd be doing in five or ten years. He hopes to be alive still. That's about all I can say, really. <laughs> I could. 
questions here that um, we thought you might like to answer. We haven't given you a chance to look at them unfortunately so it'll be off the top of your head as it were. So it might be a bit more truthful than if we gave it to you a few minutes before to, to make some questions and answers up. But firstly, um, what do you think Mark's attitude to family was? I mean as his cousin obviously you were very close to him but what was his attitude to the immediate family? Oh well he loved his family so much and he was always there for us if we, we needed him for anything. I mean he was a he was a good cousin, he was a good son to his parents and a good brother to his, to Harry and he loved his grandparents as well. No, he was a good he was a he was good a boy. Family orientated. Yes, very yeah. much so. You touched on the second question we've got here was what was he like to you as a cousin? Because I mean you were actually more than a cousin really to him, weren't you? Yeah, Mark and I were like brother and sister. We we grew up, especially in our teenage times, and when Mark passed away, I didn't lose a cousin, I lost a brother, Yeah. and nothing can ever take that away from me. I mean, you, you gave us some lovely stories on the on the, the video where you used to play on the steps and um, do music and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you ever tempted to go into the music business with him or do you think Mark was, was the talented one in the family? Or? No, Mark was the talented one. What I can gather, my grandmother used to be a singer. Oh, right. And that's who... So it's, it came down a generation, you yeah. think? Yeah, my father had a terrific singing voice, but not me. I'm all right for someone who's deaf. <laughs> 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 um, when you knew him as as the, the boy Bolan or the boy Fell, did you ever think that he would become famous? I mean, we all know that he boasted and said that he was going to be famous, and from the age of eight or nine, he let everybody know that he was going to be famous. But did you all really think he would do it, or did you just really no. sort of poo poo it? Mark always wanted to be, from the age of 11 or 10, he always wanted to be something, and we all knew he was because he, he, he had the front. You know, he'd done modelling, he's, he's done everything, and he right. had the front together to get on and that's what he wanted to do and that's what he done. So he was he was multi-talented really from a from child an early age, and everybody yeah. could see it so he wasn't laughed at as such by the family. Oh no, 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 all his friends. He no. always had a big crowd of friends and they all stood behind him, everyone did. So it sounds like right from when he was very little he had a huge ego which he had as a star obviously. Mm. I mean and I think everybody in the music business has to have an ego to get where they're getting to. But was he ever insecure about anything no. that you know of? No, what I know of, no. Mm. So there was, he, he was that sure of himself, he knew he was going where he wanted to go and he was going to get there? Yes, you know, he wanted to get somewhere and he, he got there. And have you got a real fond memory of him as, as an individual item that, or is it sort of too many? Uh, there's a load of things with Mark. And um, it's like I said, that we grew up together and he was such a lovely boy and mm. everyone liked him and everyone loved him. Even the boys were jealous of him from his looks, yeah. his good looks and great personality. He was still liked and loved by them all. And when he came back into the family, having reached megastardom, which he undoubtedly reached, when he was with family, did he try and put the, the I'm a star attitude on or if he oh, did, did, no. he, did he get shot down in flames or did no. he revert back to the... No, Mark was just normal. 
Just like, like... It was just him? Just him. You, you know, no airs and graces. That was just Mark. He was just abnormal. Yeah, that's a nice to know. boy. Because we all know that the Mark that's on the stage, and we all know certain aspects of Mark from interviews, but the personal side of him, nobody ever really has got to know. And it's always um, been a little bit of a, an enigma to, to fans as to what he was like at home. So you say really, he, he was different at home, he wasn't standoffish, he was no, a normal a, person. a normal person. So, as, as his cousin, and as his very, very close cousin, did you actually collect cuttings and records, or did you like his music even? I mean, just because he was your cousin doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> you had to like You've it. put me in a spot here, Barry, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I didn't really like much of Mark's music. Mm -hmm. I was more of a Motown person, but right. as I've got older, yes I have. You've learned to appreciate I've, or you've come to appreciate I've, it. Yes, yeah. I really have, but um, I, at the time, no, I, I didn't. No. Well, I can understand that because I mean, just because he's your cousin doesn't mean to say that you, you've got to like what he was doing. No. Um, and I mean, several people have said to me before, oh, Caroline must have lots of photos and lots of memorabilia. No, and no, I didn't because when you're somebody's cousin, you, you like anybody else, you don't collect no. photos of cousins or whatever. It's only for the people who I've met over the years who's very kindly enough to give me things mm -hmm. and what I have collected and put away. And if I get doubles, I give to Roland. Uh -huh. uh, but otherwise, no, I haven't really got anything of Mark's. No. Right. Um, do you think that Mark has actually been properly recognised by the music business? I mean, admittedly, the, 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 the PRS um, put a stone at Barnes Common two years ago for him, and um, critics are beginning to reassess the albums and the singles and give it some critical acclaim now, which it didn't get originally. But is there anything else you think that can be done for Mark? A lot can be done for Mark. I mean, since Mark's passed away, I don't think there's enough done for him. They, sh they should make his name bigger. Mm -hmm. the, his music's played all the time. I phone up people and and things like that, and they just they they just laugh at me. I think I'm stupid. But no, I think things should be done for Mark, and his name should carry on. I'm fighting at the moment to see if I can get him a Brit award. Oh right, yes, the the Brits. Yes. Because last year, of course, was a travesty, wasn't it? I mean, placebo playing 20th Century Boy with Bowie as guest vocalist. Yes. And not a <laughs> mention not. Of, of Mark at all. No. You know. So what, what are you actually doing at the moment to, to get this Brits thing off the, off I the ground? I found out this young lady called Wendy Hunt and I have to write to her and see if she can help us out with it and I hope she will. If not, I've told them that I will put it in the newspapers and on television. I will fight for Mark to right. get this award, being the century boy, what he was, mm -hmm. and I know that he he would want it, and that's something of what I'm going to keep, and every time I go to the gigs, or wherever I go, I will take it so his fans can pick it up and hold it, because they deserve a little bit of luck with it as well. Nice idea, and I, I'd say very fitting that we're at the end of the millennium, and it should be that the first Brits of the, the new millennium should recognise the 20th century boy. So mm -hmm. we're you know, wish you luck in that one. Obviously, we'll give you all the help we can to, Thank you. to get that off the ground. Thank you. Um, what, are you what are your feelings about Mark and, and the following that he's actually got? I mean, does it, st does it surprise you still that there are still such a lot of people that are prepared to go to, you know, to, to lengths that many people would think are you know, a bit, bit batchy, really? To, to keep his name alive. I mean, um, w did you expect that Mark would still be famous 20 odd years after his sad passing, or? Um, no, I'm not really surprised because since I've been going the last day to 10 years and the following, and pe their children, they bring their children along as well. Well, it's mm -hmm. absolutely terrific, and the following is absolutely marvellous, and people only want to take Mark off. And when I go to Golders Green and all over, um, it's, it's terrific, you know, no, this yeah. is what Mark would have wanted. Right. And I, I appreciate everything what the fans do for him, and if they need any help, they know I'm always behind 
to, to help to them as home. much as I can. Yeah, so as you know, I mean, my little boy's called Mark, and I know. I think there's um, a lot of little Marks running around. <laughs> and um, with the next one that's coming along, if it's a little girl, it's Sam, which is Telegram Sam. So oh, that's we're going to carry the name on that way along. That's terrific. Um, do you actually read any of the fanzines? I mean, we know you go to the conventions because we've seen you at um, the Gold is Green ones and um, a couple of the others you've been to as well. Um, do you read any of the fanzines? Do you? Do they send them to you? Do other other editors send you the fanzines um, to read? Or it's only what you send me, Barry. Right. Or what? Is it Dave and Terry? Jeff, Terry. Terry. He's, yeah, you, you get main yeah. man. Yeah, and I read those. Right. So, so you, what you two send me the arrest, nobody knows. So you keep up to date with what's I actually keep happening up to date on the what scene, they do. which is good. It's how it should be, really. Um, how do you see Mark's career developing? Had he not been involved in the accident, I mean, do you think he would have stayed purely and simply as a rock star, would say, or do you think he would have? gone into performing the performing arts or do you think he would have gone into producing other people or do you think he would have done all, all three or four you know and um he might have not carried on doing the music he might have thought well I'm getting older mm -hmm. he might have gone into acting he liked to to act right and help other people so you think in he, their career. he would have stayed in the performing realm somewhere along yeah. the line even if it wasn't actually performing yeah but do you think he would have ever given up writing music or do you think he oh no no he would have carried on writing music and poetry because that's what he really liked to do mm -hmm. which actually i haven't got this one written down but it just sort of spurs me on a little bit with the acting side there's always been the rumor that mark appeared in orlando back in 1963 the tv series mm -hmm. would have you got any memory of mark appearing in that or doing any acting for for the bbc all those years ago I mean, to date, there's been no documentary evidence because the tapes have been wiped and nobody knows. I didn't know he'd done any acting for the so BBC. It's no, no, the so only programme I knew he'd done for the BBC was just before he died for the children's programme. Right. Yeah. But otherwise, no acting. No, I didn't know he'd done that. Um, finally then, before we don't keep you um, for too long, what would you say that Mark's most lasting impact on the music world was? What do you think he actually gave to the music world? If any, if you had to sort of sum up Mark in a couple of, you know, or a few sentences, what do you think he gave to the music world? He's looking at everything what he had. Everything he gave his whole soul to it, as you know. Mm -hmm. He absolutely loved it. He always wanted to do something like that, and he absolutely, you know, gave everything what he could to it. So, so he was an innovator towards lots of other people that came after mm. and would be remembered as such oh, yeah, for, for doing that. Yeah, a lot of people still take him, still follow his footsteps and still play his music. Mm. Right, I, I think that's the end of my questions, Caroline. Thank you very much. You're very welcome indeed, Barry.